Welcome to Timberlake Online. Service will get started in just a few minutes, and whether you're joining us from Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or the official online campus platform, we're so glad that you're here. All of these formats are a great way to get connected through chat and to engage in service, but only at the online campus can you find all of our service resources, such as a built-in Bible, interactive message notes, and live prayer. And if you're not already, come hang out with us at online.timberlakechurch.com and say hi in chat. We'd love to get to know you and help you get connected. Lastly, don't forget to bookmark this page so you can find us again next week at any of our service times. And with that, I'll see you in chat. Welcome to Timberlake. My name is Jordan and I serve on the kids team. Whether you're joining us online or at one of our physical locations, we're so glad you chose to join us today. If you haven't already downloaded our app, check it out. It'll help you fully engage in the service. 
If you select the Connect menu option in the app, you'll find message notes, giving options, and even a way to sign up for events or groups that are coming up. You'll also find a connection card. Please fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. We'd love to know that you are here and help you find your next right step. Discover Timberlake is an opportunity to get a behind the scenes look into how we're structured as a church, our core beliefs, and where we're headed in the next few years. If you're interested in learning more about the church or have questions you'd like answered, sign up for our next Discover Timberlake. Lunch and childcare are provided. Here at Timberlake, we believe life is better together. If you're not yet part of a group, you're missing out on so much of what being a part of Timberlake is all about. Groups are the best place to find friendships, experience community, and grow in your faith. You can see a list of available groups and sign up at TimberlakeChurch.com or on our Timberlake app. Join us for our next Baptism Sunday. If you have accepted Jesus but have not been baptized, this is the best decision and we want to celebrate with you. Just visit TimberlakeChurch.com to learn more and sign up. For more information and to get connected, download our app or visit us at TimberlakeChurch.com. We'd also love to connect with you on social media. I hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Thank you for joining us today. today. Hey! 
Don't know me 
of my favorite songs uh, because when we uh, are in God's presence, we see it through the Bible, we see it everyday life, that people are never the same again when, they, when we allow ourselves to say, God, I want to be in your presence and I want to be present with you. And so that's what I hope that you'll do uh, for the rest of our time today, that you'll, you'll say, God, I just want to experience you in a new way. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you for each and every person here. God, I thank you for the promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, Lord, that you are here by the power of your Holy Spirit in, in, in a special way that's hard for us to understand. God, that you are here to uh, redirect our lives. God, that you are here to physically heal. God, we would invite that. Lord, Not that you owe us anything, but God, that it would just be a sign of your presence. God, that we would come to you and we would be changed. We pray this in the name that's above every name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Timberlake. I uh, want to welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, there is so much going on. I'm glad you're here. Uh, those online, our other locations as well. I'm Ben. I'm the lead pastor. Uh, we are in a series called Crash Course. I kicked it off uh, last week. Next week, which is also International Weekend, sort of a big weekend for us. Uh, come, enjoy, enjoy it. Bring a friend too. It's a, it's a great celebration of what God has done and, and really has done in maybe a unique way even here at Timberlake Church. Uh, I'm going to be speaking again next weekend. This weekend you have a special treat because you're going to hear uh, from Pastor Jedi. Uh, he is our uh, runs our group so much here at Timberlake Church, and he did an incredible job. I feel a little bit insecure because so many people came up after the last service and said he was amazing. Uh, so, uh, but I, I'm really, uh, in fact, he's, he's a very humble person. And he said, uh, hey, what do I need to change? And I said, God just spoke to me. And uh, I don't always say that, but God really, and he's going to speak to you if you're open. So I hope you will be. And uh, you're going to hear God hopefully in a fresh way. Well, we uh, also are going to uh, receive our offering at this time. Uh, you can give online. Uh, you can give here in the auditorium. Uh, and really, this is an investment uh, in God's work. And, and even as we were uh, singing that song, I was thinking about it. Uh, it. For you, if this is like a attention thing, it really isn't with most people here, is when we say yes to God, it's natural to say yes in our finances and that we would invest in God's kingdom work uh, here at this church, our mission partners, and thank you for that, especially in the month of January, uh, after people have been so generous in December. Uh, it's important uh, because we want to move forward strong it, throughout 2023. Well, of course, this is also uh, Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, uh, as we celebrate that uh, holiday and really what that means uh, for our country, and so uh, we want to recognize that as well, and we're going to do that if you take a look at the screen. Why don't you turn to two or three people around you? Say hello. No, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope with this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, you guys actually talk back to me. That's amazing. 
This is going to be great. Uh, good morning. My name is Jedi. I'm one of the pastors here on Team at Timberlake. So glad to be with all of you and so excited to be able to share today. And uh, hello to all of you who are joining us online and at our other campuses. Can we give a quick hand to them in the room for them to look like? Yeah. We have uh, thousands of people who join us every single week, and I'm so glad that you're here as well. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet, meet many of you. I had oversee missions, and I've done groups, and I started a new role here at Timberlake recently. Uh, you may have seen me on the worship team for a while. So I'm the groups and worship development pastor. So I still oversee the small groups here, but I also work with Jillian, our worship director, who you hear singing this morning. She absolutely killed it, right? Uh, and then there's Ben, who's our tech director, and he's going to hate this because he's so shy, but he's the one who really makes this all possible, and he's sitting back there. Can we give him a hand real quick? Let's go, Ben. I love you. And so anyways, uh, I get to be a part of Timberlake Worship, and we have some amazing things coming this year. I'm so excited. Can't wait for you to hear that. A bit more about me, I'm married to Sarah, my wife. Um, well, someone give Sarah a shout out. Yeah, cool. Um, there's a photo that you're going to see right here. And uh, Sarah and I, we've been married for almost 16 years. And some of you are now wondering how that's possible because you think I look 27. So you're like, did you get married when you were 11? Like maybe it was a cultural thing. No, it wasn't a cultural thing. Uh, I was in my 20s when I got married. <laughs> Uh, we have two kids, Elise, who's six, and Annette, who's three. They're the two cute Asian kids there, and they're running around the lobby. You'll, you'll see them. They're wonderful. I love them. And, you know, I used to say that my wife was my better half, uh, or that's what some people say, but I would always usually say that Sarah was my better 75%, but after parenting together and watching her be a mom, I definitely think she's the better 100%. Uh, she's just a great human being. You know, she's my best friend, my partner in life, the anchor of our family, and if you're wondering, did he seriously just take time from his first Sunday preaching moment at Timberlake to score some brownie points? The answer is yes, and yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, so we're in the middle of a new series called Crash Course, where we've been learning some practical tips that you can incorporate into your life as we go into the new year. And Pastor Ben last week gave a sermon called Best Practices Faith, where he talked about how to incorporate faith into your everyday. And if you haven't heard that yet, I uh, suggest that you go and do that. It was an incredible message and really helpful. And this morning, I want to talk to you about something that I think is really important. But, but uh, before we do that, I, I kind of have to share a story. Because as I was thinking about crash course, uh, I had a, a crash incident or a crash, a literal one, recently. And so this past Christmas Eve, we had some incredible service here at Timberlake. There were thousands of people, right, who got to experience the hope of Jesus but we did something that we've never done before in Timberlake history. We canceled one of our Christmas Eve services due to an ice storm that hit our area. Uh, it was absolutely crazy for those of you who weren't here. Now, I have lived in Boston uh, for 10 years before moving here. And so, like, I'm good with snow and ice. I've literally driven in blizzards. I'm actually more afraid of Washington drivers than I am of snowy conditions. Uh, true story. And so I was like, it's fine. So I was running errands. I was getting some groceries. I was out on the roads. And as our leadership were making decisions, they were like, hey, could you check out the roads on the way to church in our parking lot? And so I made my way to church, kind of, you know, did a report. And I went down into the lower parking lot and, and drove around. And it was totally unsafe. The parking spaces were totally covered and frozen over. Uh, and then I noticed that there were these cones that were blocking the hill that comes up to the upper parking lot. And I also saw that the cones were wide enough for my car to go through. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to check it out. So I drove up the hill. Miracle that that happened the way it did. And then came up here and was just driving around. It was a total ice rink, you know, spinning, doing fun stuff, things like that. Well, I uh, had to give my report, so I decided to make my way back down. And I called Pastor Shane, so he's on the phone with me when this happens. So I'm going down this little tier here, and you know, the parking spaces are slanted, and my car starts to go sideways very quickly, and I crash into the curb so hard that it breaks my wheel, like the metal cracks, it breaks off. Uh, the steering gets busted, uh, and, and I'm, you know, uh, like, okay, um, I have to, you know, find my way to get down, and so I kind of like bounced like this for a little bit before I made my way, uh, and it's Sarah's car, okay? So I have to call her, right? And so uh, I, I get on the phone and I tell her, honey, I crashed, the wheel's broken, steering is busted, it's not really drivable, but you know, I'm safe, I'm okay. Um, and you know, like I could have like, I don't know, rolled off into tier one and been upside down, but that didn't happen. I'm a little emotionally, traumatically, you know, damaged, but I think I'll be okay. I did my breathing exercises, I'm all right. 
And the first question that she asked me is, what about my groceries? <laughs> True story. That is what 16 years of marriage does right there. Now, I get it. It's her car. I totally wrecked it, right? Thankfully, her groceries were okay. And so I was able to take those back uh, with some friends who helped me to get back home. And, and, and I felt bad and a little ashamed. And so I do what most normal people do. I went on social media to feel better about myself, and this is what I saw. Literally ice skating. Look, if you weren't here, it was absolutely crazy. Seattle was literally frozen over. It was a real life Seattle freeze. Now, oh yeah, there's a reaction there, right? For some of you who've heard that phrase, you know that that's not what we think about when we hear Seattle freeze. Uh, if you're new to the area and you don't know what the Seattle freeze is, let me introduce you to it. Uh, this is from urbandictionary.com, a totally legit source, okay? So, the Seattle freeze is a sociological phenomenon commonly found in the Seattle area. It concludes the majority of residents as snobby, cold, unfriendly, with a fake, polite exterior. Now, there are some of you who are like, dude, I just moved here, and this is true. And then there are others of you who are like, no, I, I live here, and I've been here for a while, and we're so friendly. We're just not hospitable like those people down south who live with no boundaries at all, okay? We're more ordered. So let me clear it up. The Seattle freeze, like people here are friendly and we are kind. It's just that it takes more steps and time to make deep connections here than in other places. I, I know some of you are wondering whether or not this is even real. Well, I can tell you that when I moved here to Washington six years ago, I absolutely felt the Seattle freeze. I hit it really, really hard. And this is what it looked like. My wife and I would meet some people that we really like, maybe our kids drive together or whatever, and we'd be like, hey, let's hang out. Let's go do a thing. And they'd be like, oh my gosh, I love you. We'd exchange numbers, we'd exchange emails, and then I'd be like, okay, cool, like we're gonna hang out, right? And they're like, yes, oh my goodness, yes, oh my goodness, we're gonna get, oh my, oh my God, oh my goodness, we're gonna get together, 100%. And then you know what happened? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. You wait a little bit? Nothing. Did I get the wrong phone number? Hey, did I, is this the right number? I'm trying to get hold of John? Nothing. And you just kind of get ghosted. Do you guys know what I'm talking about, some of you? Yes, yes, I will take that. Now, it's weird when you experience it in everyday life, but when you experience this in the church, it gets super weird. Because we read verses like this. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And then we come here and it's hard to make relationships. It's hard to make connections. And we're like, what is going on? Why is it so hard to find true connections even at church? Now, for some of you, it's a little different. Maybe you've been in the area for a long time and you've had some amazing friends, but in the last three years, they all sold their houses and went to warmer areas. Like you're the last one standing, you know what I mean? Like in a zombie apocalypse movie. You look around your neighborhood and you have all new neighbors and they're from all parts of the world and you come here uh, to the lobby on, <laughs> on Sundays at Timberlake and you're like, I'm really glad these people are here, but who are they? Like seriously, and... The thing about loneliness is that sometimes it's not about the amount of people that are around you, but, but the people who actually know who you really are. And maybe this morning you're like, you know, when I look around, I, I really don't want to admit that there aren't many people anymore because they've all moved away. Now, you might be like, well, Pastor Jedi, that doesn't apply to me because I'm young and cool and I use social media a lot. Like I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all of these things. Uh, and so maybe you think that your digital connections and all the likes you get somehow validate your sense of connection. Well, there's a study done by the University of Pennsylvania that showed the complete opposite. It shows that high usage of Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram actually increase feelings of loneliness rather than decreasing them. And uh, another study by JAMA Psychiatry said that people who spend more than three hours daily on social media had heightened risks of psychological and mental health issues, including loneliness, depression, and suicide. And so if you think that you're connected and you're like, mm, I'm good, I got my friends, maybe you're actually lonelier than you think you are. And of course, none of this is taking into account that we all experienced a global pandemic that kept us isolated and separated for far too long. And maybe you're here and you're like, you know, as the world is starting to come back together, I'm just not ready yet. 
You know, I'm just not ready to send my kids back there or to do the things that we used to do. And it looks like everything is moving forward, but not you. Now, we all go through something at some point in our life where we feel this way, uh, this kind of disconnect, this kind of isolation. And ultimately, what we're feeling is that we feel left out. Now, I know, no one wants to admit that. Hard thing to own. And because you may not even realize that it's true about you, but what happens is that we think everyone else has friends and everyone else has connections, but not us. So we convince ourselves that it's better to live life alone, to do our own things, to go through our own calendar, our own schedules, and we still kind of feel left out. And so if we feel this, I think an important question to ask is, what do we do when we feel left out? How do we navigate this disconnect and this isolation that we experience? Now, fortunately for us, this isn't a new question, and today I want to look at the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19. He was someone who was disconnected for different reasons, but he had an encounter that changed his life. So this is what we find, okay? Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So in this account in scripture, there are really like three people, three main people that I want us to pay attention to. Jesus, the crowd, and Zacchaeus. And I'm gonna go through these really, really quickly. So starting with Jesus, just a bit of context. At this point in Jesus's ministry, he is the hottest thing in Israel, all right? He's come down, done these amazing miracles where blind people are seeing, deaf people are hearing, dead people are coming back to life. And he's been teaching principles about God's kingdom that no one has ever heard before. All the while claiming that he's the son of God. And people are kind of torn. Some people believe him and are massively following him. Whereas other people are kind of like plotting to kill him because he is threatening all of the political and religious power that they had during that time. And so Jesus is really impacting the culture. He's the hottest thing in Israel. And wherever he goes, crowds start to form. Okay, so the crowd is kind of the second person I want you to think about, people I want you to think about. The crowd is filled with people who want to see Jesus, right? This miracle worker, this amazing teacher. And some are there just for the spectacle. Some are there just to see if he'll mess up. And others are there who need a divine work of God to happen in their life. They're coming because they've heard that he can truly bring change and transformation. And lastly, we have Zacchaeus. Now, he's the person that I really want us to focus on. And the Bible gives us three details about who he is. The text says that he was a tax collector, that he was wealthy, and he was short. So first, it's important to note that he was a tax collector. Now, no one likes tax collectors, not today and not back then. And uh, as evidence of this, I Googled some IRS jokes, and they are just simply brutal, okay? I wanted to show a lot of them, but they're really bad. So I'm going to show you one, okay? So here's one example. What's the difference between an IRS agent and a carp? One is a bottom-feeding scum sucker, and the other is a fish. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely brutal. It hurts, right? Uh, Okay, if you work for the IRS, look, we love you. Jesus loves you. Timberlake is a safe place. Don't worry. We're glad you're here. But sadly, the truth is we don't like tax collectors. We don't like IRS agents. Not now and not back then. But in Jesus' time, they had even more reason to dislike them because they worked for Rome. The nation of Israel was under Roman oppression. And so basically, these tax collectors were unjustly collecting uh, money for the oppressors. And they were seen as those who had betrayed their own kind. Secondly, it says that he was wealthy. And, and this is important. It's kind of connected to the first. See, what these tax collectors would do is that they would get paid by their Roman officials uh, for collecting taxes, but they would add extra taxes on top to line their own pockets and to fill their bank accounts. And if people complained, they really couldn't do anything because then the tax collector would just tell the Roman officials that they didn't pay their taxes. A lot of corruption, a lot of like bad stuff. And so they were seen as those who betrayed their kind, but also stole from their kind, like robbers and thieves. And the last thing that the text tells us is that it says he was short. Now this detail is important because it's actually the thing that Zacchaeus is most known for. 
If you grew up in the church, you may have heard a song like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. Yeah, you guys are like, that's weird. Yeah, I know. We don't sing those songs at Timberlake. No weird stuff here. But at 9 a.m., they were like, oh, I know that song. I was like, oh, I feel so sorry. Uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He was short, okay? Now, I kind of know what that's like. I'm 5'6". I'm not tall. And I get reminded of this every now and then in my life. And this is how it happens, okay? So uh, I'm at the mall. I'm shopping. Or we're looking at something online. And, you know, I see some mannequins that have a look like this. And I'm, this is Zara. So I'm like, oh, man, I really like that. Like, oh, that looks good. A little jacket, the hat, you know, the shoes, the whole look. That fit is fire. And uh, while I look at this, I, I, I talk to my wife, Sarah, and I'm like, hey, honey, what do you think? Like, I like that look. And she goes, no, absolutely not. It won't work for you. And I'm like, why won't it work for me? And she says, because you have short legs. That's why. <laughs> short legs. Okay? And if you guys are like, am I allowed to laugh at that? Yes, I shared the story. Okay? This is, like, helpful for me. But I am short leg short. Zacchaeus was, like, biblically short. The writers felt... <laughs> that it was so important to write this detail about him. And it's really important to keep in mind because what's about to happen won't make sense if you don't remember that he was short. So he was a tax collector, he was wealthy, and he was short. And now people really did not like him because the Romans didn't like him because he was still a Jew. Basically a hired hand to do the dirty work that they didn't want to do. And the Jews didn't like him because he was betraying his people and stealing from them. And he was disconnected and had no real place to belong. Ironically enough, Zacchaeus is the person that knows what it feels like to be left out. Disconnected for different reasons, but he knows that feeling that we're trying to figure out today. So what happens in the story is interesting. Jesus is passing through the city of Jericho and Zacchaeus wants to see him, but the crowd is just filled the streets, completely full. And no one is giving him space to get up to the front. Right? It's not like a snowflake lane where if you go, they'll let you come up with your kids or they'll like do some kind of a thing. But no, no, it's not like that at all. Like, it's completely packed. They are isolating him, saying, no way. You're the chief tax collector. You're the worst of the worst. We are not going to let you encounter Jesus. So Zacchaeus is like, fine, whatever. I'm used to doing my own thing. So he runs ahead on the road, and he decides to climb into a tree, just chilling up there. Now, there's three reasons why a grown person like Zacchaeus would climb into a tree. Maybe he just really likes trees, and that's kind of like his thing. Uh, or secondly, he's crazy, he's out of his mind. Or thirdly, maybe he's so desperate for longing and connection. Maybe he wants to be seen that he's willing to do something absolutely insane. I mean, have you ever felt that way where you wanted something so badly you know, like where deep inside you were like, I don't care if I get embarrassed or I don't care if I'm made fun of for this, but, but I really, really want this. And you go and do something crazy. That's kind of what Zacchaeus was doing when he goes into the street. Now, what happens next is not something that anyone would have expected. Jesus is walking down in the crowd. He sees Zacchaeus up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, bro, what are you doing up there? Come on down. I'm going to go to your house today. I'm going to go to your house today. And uh, there's a really important spiritual principle here that I just want to say really quickly. In our moments of loneliness and isolation, God will always provide an opportunity for you and I to connect. He'll always show up. And, and for Zacchaeus, it shows up right here, very dramatic fashion. Come down. I'm going to go to your house. And the, this opportunity, honestly, Zacchaeus could have said no. He could have very clearly said, um, I don't know about that. But the text tells us right here that he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now, I know that if you can pass this detail and miss what's really happening. Most people would not do what Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus let Jesus in. And the reason why most people wouldn't do that because when we're isolated or when we've been hurt or when we've separated ourselves, we don't want to connect with people. So what we do is like push them away and we keep them at a distance, right? Zacchaeus could have said, uh, Jesus, thanks so much. I'm good. I saw you. Uh, we're good. We're, we're, we're done, right? Or he could have said, my cleaners were sick this week and my house isn't ready. I really can't have you come over. Or we have children and you really don't want to use a kid's bathroom. Or Jesus, like, uh, I'm so busy. I'm like way more busy than you could ever imagine. Tax collector, chief tax collector busy. No, thank you. He doesn't do that. He lets Jesus in. He welcomes him gladly. 
And the truth is that, yes, God will always give you an opportunity to connect, but the choice to connect will always be up to you. You can make an intentional choice to take yourself out of that loneliness when those opportunities show up. Instead of keeping people out or pushing them away, you and I can do something radically different, the complete opposite thing that we would not think to do. And so what do you do when you feel left out? Well, when you feel left out, let people in. Let people in. It's exactly what Zacchaeus does, and it completely changes his life. And if you and I do that in our moments of feeling isolated, I know that it would change ours too. I know you're thinking, what, what are you talking about, let people in? Like, I'm, my life is good. I'm on my own. You know, I'm doing my own thing. It's okay. Our family's fine. Can I just tell you that if you look in Scripture, we're not meant to be isolated. You and I were created actually to be in community. Think about this, okay? In Genesis 126, it says, let us make mankind in our image. God himself from the very beginning exists in community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is never alone, has never been alone. Let us make mankind in our image. So we are now creating the image of God made by community for community. And, and, and when you look at the Genesis account, the same chapter, God is creating the world and he's looking at everything he's made and he's like, the trees are good, the sky is good, the oceans are good, the animals are good, Adam's good, everything is good. But the first thing in the Bible that is listed as not good is this. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Like, it is absolutely true that God is enough for us and that we can have nothing else. But God said, no, I don't want Adam to be by himself. Even though he has me, even though he has the animals, even though he has all of creation, it is not good for man to be alone. And he makes Eve, right? We were created by community for community. So when you feel left out, when I feel left out, we have to let people in. So how do we do this? And very quickly, I want to share three practical ways of how to let people in to your life, okay? The first way is join a group. Now, I know you're like, oh my gosh, you're the group pastor and you totally just like use the opportunity. Yes, job security. You know what I mean? I got to do what I got to do. No, seriously though, join a group. The reason why you join a group is because groups are the place where we find freedom. Now, you won't find freedom just by joining a group. What you actually have to do is that you have to join a group and then show up as your true self and live with vulnerability. And when you do that, you'll find freedom. Dr. Brene Brown is now known as the foremost expert of vulnerability in the world. But when she started her research, she actually wasn't studying vulnerability. She started by studying the topic of shame. And what she found completely wrecked her because she found that the answer for vulnerability, or the answer for shame is actually vulnerability. This is what happened. She heard hundreds and thousands of stories who were, uh, of people who were experiencing pain and had gone through trauma and they were having these difficult situations. And a lot of them were stuck in cycles of uh, pain and just couldn't get past. But then there was a group of people who were like authentically free, completely present. They just like glowed and radiated with all the good things that we want, right? And she called this group the wholehearted. And so she started talking more with the wholehearted and she was like, what do these people do? And she found that they had one characteristic in common. They embraced excruciating vulnerability. They shared their stories. They told people about what had happened, some things that were absolutely horrible. They didn't hide it away or try to get past it. They just openly let it be a part of their life. They weren't defined by it anymore, but they were telling people. And as they were telling people, there was other people who said, oh, me too. I've been through that. Oh, you feel that way? I feel that way. Oh, I thought I was the only one, but I'm not. And when excruciating vulnerability led to connection, what happened was empathy was experienced. And she found that the antidote for shame is actually empathy. So this is how you find freedom in groups. You join a group, you show up as your honest self, and then you tell the truth. And, and, and we don't want to do that because we think, oh, I can't tell my truth. I, I, can't, I can't go to Lance's parenting class and say that I love my kids. They're amazing. I would give my life for them, but they're literally the bane of my existence. I can't say that. You know what's crazy is that if you went into that parenting class and said that, 
you'd find other parents who are like, oh my goodness, me too. I love them, but you know what? They're just like vampires sucking the life out of me. I got some nods in the room already, see? I'm, I'm feeling safe. My shame's going away right now. This is how we find freedom. We find it in divorce care and grief share where we talk about the circumstances that we're facing and we say, I'm having a hard time. This isn't easy for me. We find it in classes like Alpha where someone comes in and they're like, I don't know if I believe in God. And honestly, the Old Testament kind of freaks me out. And someone says, me too. I have the same issues you do. And all of a sudden, we aren't isolated anymore. We aren't like ashamed anymore because empathy destroys shame. So join a group. Find freedom. All right, the second thing that I want to tell you, and this one might be a little hard for you, is invite someone into your house. Okay, invite someone into your house. Now, I wish I could tell you that most of us are really good at letting people into our personal spaces, but the truth is that most of us actually live our life kind of like this. Come on out, bro. Come on out. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, so this is Isaiah. He's one of my residents uh, in groups. And this is why we actually started the residency program for this moment right here. Um, <laughs> we live our life in a bubble. Now, what's funny is that you could walk around and like people can interact with you, but they never really interact with you, right? And some of your bubbles are like this big. Some of them are twice the size. Some of them are as big as a church. Some of them are as big as a town. Like you don't let anyone near into your space, and I love this picture uh, that happens in the story because Jesus goes right past Zacchaeus' bubble. He says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. He doesn't even give himself an option. He invites himself over. And you know, the people of God, this is what they did over and over again. In Acts 2, there's this verse that describes the early church, and I love this. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, worship and church, what they did. But listen to this. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were saved. There's something about when you worship publicly, but then you eat together in homes and God says, I'm going to bless that. There's something magical that happens for people and for us. Thanks, Isaiah. Can we give him a hand again? <laughs> So invite someone into your house. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, Pastor Jedi, I, I was with you, but man, I can't do that. Like, look, Sarah and I, we used to host large gatherings of people all the time. We had a 600 square foot apartment in Boston and we would invite like 25 college students. No big deal, okay? But seriously, like for the last four years, we hadn't invited anyone to our house. 900 square feet, a uh, little condo that we own in Kalahani. And uh, we decided that we were going to own someone from Timberlake. And so we, I work with Haley Mav, who played drums today. She's an amazing drummer. Uh, I've been her, working with her on spiritual leadership and development and stuff. And so we were like, let's have her over. We freaked out. What's she going to do when she goes in the kid's bathroom? Like, how, how do we cook food again? Like, where do we sit? Like, oh my gosh, like, all of our white tablecloths has food stains. What is she going to do? She's going to think we're dirty human beings. It was amazing. We freaked out. But since then, we have people over every single week. And it's changed the dynamic of our house. It's totally changed the dynamic of our family and of our kids. So invite someone into your house. So here's the third thing. I want you to share the love with others. Some of you might be saying, you know what? I'm actually doing pretty well. Like, I don't feel like I have this loneliness thing. I have good connections and friendships. Uh, and Zacchaeus, after he had this encounter with Jesus, his heart was filled with love and with connection. And this is what the text tells us. It says that Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll pay them back four times the amount. He decides to share the love. And if you're someone here and you're like, yeah, I'm not really feeling lonely. Well, then share the love. Extend that kindness to someone that uh, may have moved here recently or, or needs help or choose to maybe volunteer uh, here and welcome people literally, you know, or go on a mission trip and make a difference or be a part of volunteering and helping at a local food bank. When we share the love that God experienced, it actually creates more connection for us than we could ever imagine. So when you feel left out, let people in. And three ways that we can practically do that is join a group, invite someone into your house, and share the love with others. I want to share with you one last story, and I want to set a little bit of context. So I was born in South Korea, and I came to the U.S. when I was like six. And um, my stepdad adopted me and raised me, okay? So I call him dad, and I'll refer him to his dad. And so my dad uh, was an incredible man, you know, 
man of God. He was a soldier in the military, kind of like my childhood hero. My parents adopted five other kids between middle school and college. And I was really proud of my family. Like it was like the most incredible, our holidays were fun, interactions fun. It was like a beautiful, beautiful thing. And when I got married to Sarah, I actually told her, hey, look, I'm, I'm a broke college student. I got no money, I got nothing, but my family is my gift to you because they're really, really amazing. Well, uh, this is a picture from Thanksgiving. And I'm gonna talk about this because 16 years ago, what happened was that my dad had an affair and it came out of nowhere. He had an affair with a woman, he left the family. My mom went through some significant health issues afterwards. My sister almost killed herself and had to be put on suicide watch for some time. It was like one of the most hardest periods of my life. And my brothers and sisters, we don't ever connect again. And I never really get to go back home because the home I grew up in is completely decimated. So this picture is from Thanksgiving and I posted um, on Instagram about it and I wanna read the post for you. I titled it, Feels Like Home. That's the thought I had last night while looking at this picture and reflecting on the day. It's been 15 years since I had that feeling. I've had glimpses of it throughout the years, but yesterday all the pieces of the puzzle were there and came together and I felt that feeling in its entirety for the first time in a really long time. Many of you don't know, but 15 years ago, my dad had an affair, left our family. It destroyed the home I grew up in. My siblings and I, we, we can never go back. So the holidays have always been a difficult time for me. But yesterday with these friends and a few others who aren't pictured here, I was able to feel that joy again. The feeling that comes from connecting with good people, multiple generations eating way too much food, hearing kids playing together and having fun, the lostness of time, as we hang out all day just chilling, inside jokes and laughter, football on the TV, several men trying dangerously to fry a turkey, but ultimately getting it done. Weird, but surprisingly good movies about dolphins that the high school kids were into, sharing what we're thankful for, comforting each other, and hearing our stories. Look, the list can go on and on, but it's really just the ability to relax, breathe, and enjoy the moment with people you care about and who also care about you. That's so special. It's an incredible gift. Today, my heart is full and thankful for the people in this picture. They feel like home. Listen, for 16 years, I didn't know what that felt like. I forgot, I almost forgot. But this was special. And it happened because about a year ago, we actually decided to let some of these people into our life. Two years ago, I had no idea who they were. Didn't know them. Crossed paths with them in the lobby. Maybe they talked to me in a booth. I didn't know who they were. But now my daughters call them Uncle Doug and Aunt Julie and Auntie Joanna. And they have a brother who's in high school who's like really tall and strong. And they've got sisters in middle school and high school. And, and all of a sudden, Sarah and I aren't so alone because we decide to let people in. When you feel left out, let people in. Maybe you're out there and you're struggling because of all the reasons that we talked about, of why you're disconnected and why you're isolated. Maybe that was something that people did to you or you did to yourself. Look, let people in. I know it's the last thing you wanna do, but it can really bring change. Like go out literally and join a group. You know, join the parenting class or join Alpha or join Divorce Care or Grief Share. If you're going through those circumstances and you need extra support, you don't have to be alone. You can find freedom this morning. Or invite someone into your house. Like literally after the service, text them. And it doesn't matter if you have to schedule it six weeks later, just do it. Like it's gonna be hard the first time and a little like chaotic, but beautiful things can happen when we let people into our individual spaces. Bubbles don't build friendships, so just let it go. Stop living your bubblicious life and let someone inside. Or maybe you're doing really well and things are going amazing for you. Look, share the love with others. Can you imagine if Timberlake became known as a church who beat the Seattle freeze? Like not known for like our amazing mailers with really incredibly good looking people or for our amazing worship or the hospitality or for our incredible pastors or whatever you like this church for. But like Timberlake is a place where you can come and find deep connections. It happens when you and I start letting people in. It happens when we start reflecting the love of Christ and we share that with each other. And we can tell people that when you come through those doors, you're going to be welcomed here. You're going to be received here. And you know what? You're coming to my house today. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. 
But when you feel left out, let people in. God can do amazing things. If you're at our campus, I'm gonna hand it off to your campus pastor now. And for everyone else here, I wanna pray for us. So let's pray. You know, there's some of you here who've, you know, you're relationally separated, but you're also like emotionally separated. You've never made that connection and allowed Jesus to be the Lord and leader of your life. The cool thing is that uh, Jesus says, I have come to save the lost. I've come to find them. And if you're here and you feel spiritually disconnected from God, never taken that step, I just want to give you the opportunity to do that. To make Jesus the Lord and leader of your life. So what I'm going to do with every head bowed and eye closed, I'm just going to look around the room starting on my right. And, and if that's you, you can just look up at me. Just right now, just look up at me if that's you. I want to take this next step of faith. God, I see you. I see you. Going in the middle now. I see you. Here at the left side. Scripture says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, if you say a prayer like this, that your life has changed in this moment and also for eternity. And so just in your heart, say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. I recognize that I'm separated from you and I don't want to go this way anymore. I want you to be the Lord and leader of my life. Forgive me for my sin, for the things that have separated me. I accept your love and your forgiveness. I want my home to be in you. I give my life to you in the name of Jesus. God, I want to pray for those who just took that step. I pray that you would encourage them, that you would bless them. And Lord, I also want to pray right now for every single person in this room, for every family who's feeling disconnected and isolated from you. Lord, it's so easy to believe the lie that, that we can just do it all on our own, that we don't need those relationships. But God, your word teaches us and you show us that we were built for community. So Lord, I speak against the lies and the doubts and the hesitations. I speak against all of those things. I pray that you would remove them right now. And I pray that you would replace them with courage, God. Courage to take that next step. Courage to let down that wall. Courage to let people in. And Lord, I pray for us as a church that as we take these small actions to let people into our lives, as we start hanging out with each other and eating, God, that we would become the kind of church where people could find deep connection, true connection, and a profound sense of belonging. Help us, dear God, in these next few weeks, in these next few days, in these next few moments, reflect the love that you have for us. We're so grateful for the ways that you connect us. We pray, dear God, that you would be glorified in all of that, and that it would be for the blessing of each family and each person here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everyone say, amen. 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 Hey, can we thank Jedi for sharing with us today? We're going to conclude the service in just a moment, but if you're here and you would like prayer for anything or if you'd like to talk to somebody, we're going to have some people stationed up here at the front that would love to link their faith with yours in prayer. For those of you joining us online, we have options in the chat that you can use as well. Uh, next weekend, Pastor Ben is going to be sharing uh, as well. It's International Weekend, and so I hope you're able to join us for that. Let me invite you to stand. I hope you have a great week, and we'll see you back next weekend. Thanks for watching. But before you go, please be sure to bookmark this page so that you can find us again next week. And are you looking for a way to get engaged and join a team? The online chat engagement team is a role that anyone and everyone can do. And it's simple. Engage with people. Create an environment where people are free to be themselves and more importantly, open to receive the truth of Jesus. And if you're interested in joining this team and becoming part of what God is doing through Timberlake Online, please let me know on your connection card. Links can be found in chat and I'll see you here next week at online.timberlakechurch.com. Dot com.